Hey class, history lesson 38. Uh, the roaring, roaring, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Man, that was a terrible, terrible beginning to the video. Anyway, we start over. Hey class, history lesson 38. The roaring 20s crash and burn. All right. I'm going to back the camera up just a little bit. Sorry for the close-up of my face right there. Let me just check to make sure that's okay. Looks good. <clears throat> Something in my throat. All right. So we've been learning about the early 1900s. Uh, progressivism started out late 1800s, carried over into the 1900s. You had guys like Teddy Roosevelt, who was a strong leader. Helped our country out in a lot of ways, probably. Um, wasn't perfect, obviously, but uh, yeah, did a lot of good things. Uh, unfortunately, you had World War I soon after Teddy Roosevelt, uh, and then you had um, the Great, well, I'm sorry, during World War I, we had the uh, Spanish flu pandemic of 1918. So we talked about that. That was the last thing we talked about. So already the 1900s are off to kind of a not, not a great start, right? Well, um, we're going to continue uh, talking about the early 1900s. And um, as you will see, things got better. But then we had um, a very bad thing that happened again in the early 1900s. So, um, yeah, so World War I comes to an end, uh, 1918. Uh, and then it was the same year that we had the, the Spanish flu pandemic, of course. But after World War I, uh, initially things weren't great because of the end of the war. The economy tanked for a bit because the government was buying products from farmers and factories and manufacturers and all of that. And as soon as the war ended, they called up these people and canceled the contracts. And so prices tanked. For a little while but it didn't take too long for the economy to recover at least for manufacturing and factories and that kind of thing farmers on the other hand continued to struggle for struggle for quite a while um, but yeah so the economy slumped for a bit uh, but it but it gave way to one of the most interesting and controversial time periods in american history okay the 1920s we call this the Roaring Twenties, okay? A very interesting, fascinating time period in our country. <clears throat> what were some of the characteristics of the 1920s? What made it so interesting? Uh, well, like I said, the economy started off slow because the government canceled their contracts with the farmers and the manufacturers, but, but soon after that, it began to take off, okay? Um, the uh, presidents during that time were conservative, they were Republicans, they were, uh, they, they were loosening the grip of government on the people, um, so they were deregulating and um, giving companies the opportunity to kind of flourish and grow. And so the economy bounced back, and for most of the 1920s, there was a very strong economy. Um, there were more consumer goods, and I forgot to write that down, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to write that down. More consumer goods than there had been before. And the reason was things were being developed, uh, inventions were happening, things were becoming more and more available to people. Uh, the assembly line becomes popular, so factories start producing, mass producing uh, certain things. Um, and so, you know, inventions, mass production. So again, uh, Henry Ford popularized the, uh, the assembly line. We talked about that. So cars became a lot more affordable and more and more people started driving them. So you had factories, you had car production. <clears throat> and if more and more people have vehicles, what starts to happen? life begins to change, right? So instead of being stuck at home all the time, if you want to go for a leisurely drive on a Sunday, 
you could do that. So you pack up the family Sunday morning and you go drive out into the mountains or into the hills somewhere and you have a picnic all day and then you drive home. And interestingly enough, during this time, church attendance actually went down because people were using their vehicles that they could now afford to go on Sunday drives. That became a thing, a Sunday drive, right? And so they do that instead of going to church. Um, so they go on picnics, uh, people started to commute to work, so they moved closer to cities, and so that's why the suburbs kind of started. So, you know, the, the city, the main part of the city is all the big buildings and, and office buildings and, and where everything is really tight together. But when you get out to the edge of the cities, you have mostly just nice homes and, and cleaner neighborhoods, and that's what we call the suburbs. So the suburbs started to spring up, so people were moving close to the city because they could drive into the city to go to work. Uh, this also brought more business, right? More business and more industry because there was more of a need for steel and plastic to build cars and the chemicals and stuff that were needed for that. Oil, of course, became much more necessary because you refine oil to make gasoline. So oil uh, became a big thing. Uh, and then there was other industry like uh, auto mechanics, people who fix cars, um, gas stations. You know, now that's one of the biggest industries in our country. There's gas stations all over the place, right? So anyway, that, the, the whole automobile industry really um, helped the economy to just take off like crazy. Uh, some other things that, that became a thing in the 1920s were vacuum cleaners. Um, they became affordable. More and more people had them. Uh, things like uh, penicillin. So I talked last time in the pandemic of 1918, you know, that medicine was not great at that time. Um, they didn't even have penicillin, which I don't know that it would have helped with the Spanish flu. I don't think it would have. Uh, but, but they didn't even have penicillin. And today, penicillin is one of the most basic medicines out there. And it, it helps tremendously if somebody has a fever or an infection or something like that. We use it for people. We use it for animals. Uh, it's, it's just a very powerful, potent, popular medicine, medication that has helped save probably countless lives. Right? So me, uh, penicillin came around in the 1920s. Um, things like hobbies like water skiing became a thing, uh, instant cameras, band-aids, candy bars, the uh, Butterfinger, I believe, was invented in the 1920s, Q-tips, hair dryers, electric shavers, traffic lights, refrigerators, imagine that, refrigerators, um, sky skyscrapers started to spring up. Now, it wasn't the beginning of skyscrapers, skyscrapers had been a thing before that, but more and more started to spring up. The Empire State Building, I believe, was built during the 1920s. And if you ever look at pictures online of people building the Empire State Building, it was before they had uh, safety regulations. And people were just kind of climbing around like hundreds of feet above the ground with no ropes or harnesses or anything. Um, anyway, but they were building the, uh, the Empire State Building. Um, airplanes were becoming a thing. So remember, the airplane had already been invented in the early 1900s, it was used in World War I in combat. Now, after World War I, people start using it for more productive things, like uh, passenger air travel started to slowly become a thing. But one of the big things that would happen was, you know, after World War I, the, the United States Air Force had all these cheap airplanes that they didn't need anymore. Partly because they weren't fighting war, and partly probably because they were upgrading and making better airplanes for the Air Force. So there's all these little biplanes these cheap little biplanes uh, that nobody wanted. So these World War I pilots would occasionally buy one of these uh, airplanes for cheap, and then they would make their living traveling around the country, uh, just flying from town to town in their little little puddle jumper airplane, their little biplane, and they would land, and they would draw a crowd, and then they would go up and they would do aerial acrobatics, like they, would, they were stunt pilots, right? So they'd go up and they'd fly around and do flips and twirls and people would watch and cheer and, and pay them money and then they would go to the next town and do the same thing. It was called barnstorming. And there's all kinds of stories about barnstorming from that day. Once again, there was no regulations, not a lot of safety concerns, and so, you know, sometimes accidents happened. Um, sometimes people died, uh, but yeah, it was the beginning of barnstorming and aerial stunts wing walking, people would walk around on the wings while they're up there and occasionally people would fall off the wings. Uh, I remember reading one story where, because when I was a kid I used to read all about airplanes and because I, I wanted to be a pilot and I was all into that. Um, and so I was reading about this and I remember one story where these two guys were barnstorming 
and they were performing a stunt where the guy was would try to uh, he would try to go from one airplane to the other. He would step off the wing of one airplane onto the wing of another airplane, and somehow he lost his balance and he started falling. And so the one airplane did a nose dive, went under him, and and timed it so perfectly that he caught him in his wing as he was like diving toward the ground um, and saved his life. Uh, anyway, but yeah, barnstorming was a big thing. Um, you had Charles Lindbergh, who was a pilot who flew his airplane. What, well, let me ask you, what did Charles Lindbergh do? He flew his airplane across the Atlantic Ocean from New York City to Paris nonstop. He was the first person to do that. There were times when he was, according to one site, he was only 10 feet above the water in the Atlantic Ocean. That's how close he was to uh, ending up, you know, drowning in the Atlantic Ocean. But anyway, he made it across and uh, he became a hero. I mean, he was a major, major hero. Uh, from that point on, he, he could just kind of travel around and give speeches and stuff like that. Um, anyway, so Charles Lindbergh. Um, so yeah, that, those were some of the things that, that came with kind of the, the booming nature of the 1920s. You had a, an uptick in entertainment. People began to um, want more entertainment, which kind of happens when you have a more affluent society, right? So radio started becoming a big thing. Um, <clears throat> presidential speeches started to be uh, published on the radio. So the presidents could speak directly to the people through the radio, it became a thing. Uh, music on the radio became a thing, and this is where jazz music started. So jazz was kind of a, a new kind of music. It was seen initially as sort of a rebellion against the typical, you know, classical style music, probably. Um, so it was the young kids, you know, uh, those young kids and the music they're listening to today. That was jazz, right? That's how it was. Uh, news started to become a thing on the radio. People could tune into the radio to get their news and that kind of thing. Um, what else happened in the 1920s? Any idea what started to become a thing? What other kind of entertainment do you think took place in the 1920s? You got it. Movies started to become a thing in the 1920s. Um, this was when Hollywood became the place to make movies. Uh, initially, they started making movies. I can't remember where. I think it was somewhere in the East. Uh, but anyway, they decided to move movie production to Hollywood. The reason for that was because the climate stayed fairly um, stable year-round. It was almost always warm, so you could go outside and shoot movies all year. Plus, you were close to the ocean. Plus, you were close to mountains. Uh, that particular part of California is close to all kinds of different landscape and geography. So depending on what kind of a scene you needed for your movie, you had it right there, right? You had the ocean, you had mountains, you had desert, you had everything. Um, and again, the climate was nice. So it was a great place and pow, that's why Hollywood is what it is today. Uh, another, any idea what another type of entertainment might have been that, that started out at this time? <clears throat> You got it. Sports. Something we don't have right now, right? No sports. Anyway, um, baseball became a big deal. So shout out to Caleb. Baseball started to become a big time thing in the 1920s. Baseball is referred to as what, Caleb? America's pastime. As far as I know, it's still considered that, even though uh, baseball ratings are not as high, I don't think, anymore as football and maybe even basketball. Um, but during the 1920s, baseball was the sport. It was the sport to watch. Um, it was more popular than other sports. So, yeah, baseball started to become a thing. Football was also a fairly popular sport, but remember we've talked about it before, football was actually pretty dangerous during this time. Uh, especially before, I'm not sure about the 1920s so much, but the, in the early 1900s, football was so dangerous that Theodore Roosevelt either threatened to, or maybe he even outlawed it for a time, I can't remember. 
Um, I think he may have actually made it illegal because people were dying playing football. They had no equipment. The rule, they didn't even have, they didn't have the kind of rules that they have today as far as like how you can tackle people and all of that. So literally people were going out there and just, they, they were brutalizing each other and guys were dying in football games. Um, so anyway, so I don't think it was quite that bad, but it was still pretty rough. Still pretty rough. You know, they might have had leather helmets and that kind of thing, but uh, football was still pretty rough. So it may be the reason baseball was more popular because people didn't have a taste. They didn't necessarily want to go out and watch a game where somebody died, right? Anyway, um, boxing, which is also rough, and some people actually died in boxing matches too, so anyway, I don't know, but it was, it was what they liked, I guess. Uh, tennis was a big thing. I know we don't pay a lot of attention to tennis anymore these days, but it was a big thing then. And of course, any idea what the other big time sport was? Not basketball, not yet, not soccer, golf. Yeah, golf, hitting that ball, right? Um, anyway, so uh, sports stars during this time were guys like Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Jack Dempsey. Jack Dempsey was a boxer. Red Grange was a football player. So yeah, that was the that was the time of the Babe Ruth. Yeah, Lou Gehrig. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> Um, another thing that kind of took place during the 1920s is what we refer to as modernism. Okay, what do I mean by that? Um, modernism is more, you know, moving more into modern times in a variety of ways. So modernism was a move away from biblical truth to more of a reliance on science. Hey, I, I just made a rhyme. A reliance on science. Good, good job, Mr. Um, anyway, uh, so moving more from the Bible to science, okay? Moving away from traditional morality, from traditional family values and things like that. Uh, so valuing science over the Bible, Evolution started to become started to become more and more popular. Now this had, this had started in the mid 1800s. Remember with Darwin, Darwinism. It began to get really popular. And again, remember it went right along with eugenics, which is also becoming popular. He had something called the Scopes Trial, where uh, people wanted to be able to teach evolution in public schools. Imagine that. They were not allowed to teach evolution in public schools at one point. Now it's completely the opposite, right? So uh, they weren't allowed to teach evolution, uh, but there was a group that wanted to be able to do it, so they challenged anyone who was willing to, to teach evolution in a public school to, to disobey the rules and teach evolution, that they would defend them in a trial. And so this big trial came up, it was called the Scopes Trial, and um, this guy went on trial because he had taught evolution in public school and he wasn't supposed to. Uh, and it was a big showdown and the creationists actually won. The evolutionists lost that trial, that battle. However, because of that trial and because of the outcome and, and the popularity and, and, and all the things that went with it and, and how it made um, front page news and, and because of the way it all went down, it actually strengthened the move in our country toward evolution and eventually led to evolution being taught in public schools and now that's all you're allowed to teach basically in most public schools. Uh, so anyway, evolution scopes trial, um, religious liberalism. So religious liberalism is compromising basic Bible doctrine. So this became really popular in the early 1900s and 1920s and so forth. 
It was this idea that people, they still wanted to be Christians, they still wanted to acknowledge God, go to church on Sundays, listen to sermons, you know, do most of the things that Christians do, except they would deny very, very basic fundamental Christian beliefs. They would, it would start with things like denying creation, um, denying the, uh, the uh, historicity of Adam and Eve. In other words, they denied that Adam and Eve were actually real, genuine people. They just kind of looked at them as mythical fairy tales. Um, they would deny things like the virgin birth. Um, and then they eventually would deny things like the actual fact that Jesus rose from the dead which is a very serious error, right? You can't be a Christian and deny that Jesus rose again. We just went through Easter. The resurrection is one of the greatest celebrations of the Christian tradition because Jesus not only literally physically died, but he literally physically rose from the dead. And religious liberals would deny that. They would say, well, it's just kind of a symbolic of what God is doing. He's taking dead things and bringing them to life and whatever. And they denied the actual physical resurrection of Jesus, um, which is, you know, God is taking dead things and bringing them to life. He's taking our dead souls and bringing us back to life, right? But the reason he can do that, the, the way he is doing that, is through the death and resurrection of Christ. And so they're denying some of the most important parts of Christianity. And this led, it was very popular for a time, but guess what happens over time? Those churches eventually die out because if you don't have any strong convictions about really important things, you know, what's the point? Why do you keep going to church if you don't even believe in those things anymore, right? So anyway, um, <clears throat> there was a fundamentalist reaction to this. This is where certain people came out and said, no, we do believe in the basic doctrines of Christianity. And so there was a fundamentalist kind of backlash against that. And the fundamentalist, um, it was good in a lot of ways, the fundamentalist movement. It later became something that maybe wasn't great all the time either. Uh, but yeah, it was kind of a reaction against the religious liberalism. Um, so, there was a lot of reaction against norms. A lot of people saying, I'm tired of doing things the way we've always done them. Uh, you know, the, up until then, America had a lot of traditional values. You know, marriage, family, uh, women tended to stay home and be mothers and and so forth, and, and people began to react against that and say, we don't want to live like that anymore. Uh, so, feminism, as I, we, you know, we just did a lesson on feminism, feminism really started to take off. Um, women were tired of having to behave a certain way, they were tired of having to be ladylike, and act in a certain way. They were tired of the expectations that their parents and old people had for them. And there began to be this big divide between the old generation and the young generation. The young generation began to do things the way they wanted to do them. So one of the quintessential groups of people during this time was a group that we call flappers. Okay, flappers were, they we're not sure where the name came from. There's a bunch of different, uh, ideas about where the name flappers came from. But anyway, they were women who would dress in short skirts and smoke cigarettes and put on makeup. And it, you know, it was the, for the first time that really was starting to become a thing. They were totally going against the norms. You know, women were not supposed to smoke. Women were not supposed to swear. Women were supposed to be ladylike. Women were supposed to be modest. All those things, all those, all those traits that all those expectations and the women were rebelling against that, saying, no, we're not going to dress modestly, we're going to smoke, we're going to swear, we're going to live how we want, dancing, all kinds of things started to come with that. And again, I'm not saying all those things are necessarily bad in and of themselves, um, but there was this kind of attitude of rebellion that was starting out. There was a lot of pleasure seeking.
so yeah, smoking, drinking, sexual freedom, um, dancing, jazz music, all this stuff. And again, you know, not necessarily all wrong, but yet there was just this kind of attitude of rebellion against the way things had been. Okay, so that was the 20s, right? That was the, uh, the 1920s, and it was this time of flamboyant living, lavish living. Uh, the economy was just, was just great. People were, had money, they had free time, they could drive their cars and go on picnics and all this wonderful thing. Well, that all came to a crashing, screaming halt in 1929 with what? Who knows? The Great Depression. What caused the Great Depression? <clears throat> um, because the economy was so good and people had money, they just started being reckless with it. So there were reckless investments. People started investing in things um, that they couldn't afford, right? Um, there was excessive borrowing. So people would take out loans to buy things that, you know, if you don't have the money, what do you do? Just take out a loan and go buy it. You know, today, you just put it on your credit card, right? Um, so that was kind of like what they were doing. Uh, and factories were overproducing. So factories were making more things than what people wanted. They were just massively producing all, remember all the stuff, vacuum cleaners? They were just massively producing this stuff and they were making more than what consumers actually needed or wanted or had the money for. And so um, uh, that was another thing. So all this stuff kind of came to a head. Uh, everything was going great until 1929 and it all kind of came to a head um, in October of 1929. beginning of October, things started to slump, uh, and then you had this day called Black, I just put a crash on October 29th, so you had this thing called Black Thursday. So stocks had been kind of steadily declining for, the, for, the, for several weeks, it, it was just kind of going down, 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 and on Thursday, I think it was October 26th, this panic hit, and people just started selling stocks. Um, so the, 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 the uh, stock mar market just plummeted. On Friday, things rallied and got a little better, but then you had that followed by, by Black Monday. And after Black Monday, you had Black Tuesday. So you have these three days almost in a row. Black Thursday, Monday and Tuesday, um, and um, this this massive crash hits the stock market. Okay, uh, by the summer you have an eighty percent drop. You have an eighty percent drop by summertime. That means that if you had invested in stocks. In, um, in September or October, they're now worth only 20% of what they were worth in the next, the next summer. They're only worth 20% of that. That's pretty significant, right? Um, unemployment was at 24.9%. The worse it got, Twenty-four point nine percent is the worst that unemployment got. Now, you might that, that's you might say, well, there's still seventy-five percent of people still had work, right? That seems like a lot. <clears throat> hey guys, once again, my battery died in the middle of uh, in the middle of a lecture, so uh, 
We're going to pick right back up where we left off. Um, so the last thing we wrote was that during the Great Depression, the highest the unemployment rate, rate the highest unemployment rate was 24.9 percent. That's how high the unemployment rate became. Now you might say, well, that means that there were still 75 percent of people were still working. 75 percent of the workforce still had jobs. That's, that doesn't seem too bad, right? But if you think about that, that means that one in four people did not have a job. One in four people that were in the workforce did not have a job. <clears throat> um, so, you know, think of four men that you know, and one of them being unemployed, right? Um, so it was, it was significant. And not only that, but even though 75% of people had jobs, those jobs didn't always pay very well because you're in an economic, serious economic downturn, right? So uh, some people had work, but they still didn't get paid very well, right? So all around, it was just a bad deal. By the way, interestingly enough, we are right now, as of this moment, we, we have the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression, right now. And you probably know why that is, right? It's because of the coronavirus. Um, because businesses have had to shut down because of social distancing, people have gotten laid off. Um, so we are at about a 13% unemployment rate right now, which isn't nearly as bad as 24 or almost 25%, but 13% is still actually really bad. Uh, that's a little bit over one in 10. So again, think of 10 men, 10 able-bodied men that you know, and one of them being unemployed, like they want a job, but they can't get a job. Um, that's what it is right now in our country. And, and some of your parents might actually be kind of off right now too, if they work for New Horizons or, or something like that, because, because of that. Now, thankfully today, our unemployment is not because of an economic crash. Um, it's because of the coronavirus. Uh, this didn't happen because of a depression. It happened because of social distancing. Uh, so we're hoping, and most people are saying, that when the social distancing is over and people go back to work, that the economy will take off, jobs will come back, and we're really hoping that that's true. We hope that's the case. Um, we hope people know what they're talking about, right? Uh, now, this coronavirus, because of the fact that people, businesses are having to close and people are having to take off work, it could cause a fairly serious um, economic downturn for a little while. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, but a lot of people are saying that once once we get back to work, that um, the economy will take off again. We'll see. Um, hopefully that's the case. But anyway, we are in the highest unemployment since the Great Depression because of the coronavirus. Uh, last year, in 19, uh, sorry, 2019, uh, the unemployment rate hit 3.6%, which is I think the lowest in the last 50 years. So the last few years have been really good years for the economy and for employment and so forth. Um, the economy has been booming. Last year we had the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years. Now suddenly, pow, we're at the highest. And again, because it's because of the coronavirus. But anyway, so that was the depression. Um, uh, unemployment was almost at 25%. People had a lot of hopelessness. There were bread lines, people waiting in line for food, and there were even people who starved to death. Uh, it was a very bad time. A lot of hopelessness, a lot of suicide. Um, Herbert Hoover was the president, probably related to Meredith. I'm not sure about that, but um, maybe she could check into that. Uh, he was the president when this all started. He was a Republican, he was a conservative. He didn't believe in getting involved and, uh, you know, trying to uh, fix the economy with government programs. He didn't believe in that. So it was his policy to just kind of keep his hands off of it and let the whole thing fix itself, right? Um, <clears throat> now, the thing is, a lot of people blame Herbert Hoover for the Depression, or at least the people that were living during that time blamed him. He was not a very popular president, but it wasn't really his fault. Uh, economic recessions um, come and go. The economy goes up and down. It's just the nature of, of the economy. It, it, you have boom and bust. You have 
downturns and and upturns. It's now now presidents can have some kind of an impact on that, but they can't really control it completely. Uh, so if um, we go through a recession, whoever happens to be the president during that time tends to get the blame, even though it may not be his fault. Um, so anyway, Herb Hoover just kind of tried to keep his hands out of the mess and hopefully hoping it would fix itself. Well, it didn't really fix itself during his presidential term. Uh, so at the end of his four years in office, the economy was still struggling and people were upset at him. So they, so he was not able to, uh, to win a second term. Um, Franklin D. Roosevelt became president um, in place of Herbert Hoover. He was a Democrat and he did believe in using government programs to fix the economy, to help people out. So he put in place all kinds of government programs to try to get people jobs, to stimulate the economy, um, to do things to try to get the economy back on track. Uh, a lot of the things at least appeared to help. People thought they were helping and it did, get, did give some people some jobs, but it really did not, overall, it did not help the economy come back. It didn't really bring the nation out of the Great Depression. Um, so the, uh, the Great Depression lasted for about 10 years. Uh, but before we get to that, one other thing happened during this time that was kind of adding insult to injury. We call it the Dust Bowl, okay? So um, people had moved into the Midwest. They were homesteading. If you guys remember that, we talked about homesteaders. They got 160 acres to farm if they uh, took care of it for five years. So people had this wonderful opportunity to move out into the, into the Midwest and start afresh, have their own land, um, farm, and, it was this, and, and, and the, the uh, adventuresome entrepreneurial spirit of the American people was, went for that. And a lot of people went out, they got their land, they started their farms, and for some of them, it was going well. Uh, their farms were, were producing and doing well. But then they had a five-year drought, a terrible drought in the Midwest. And on top of that, after five years, this terrible uh, wind weather system came in where it just got terribly windy one year. And the wind just blew layers and layers of topsoil off the ground, particularly in western Oklahoma. So because farmers were plowing their fields, they'd, they'd plow their fields, right, and, and dig up the topsoil, and the wind came along and just picked up this topsoil and just blew it. Um, for hundreds and even thousands of miles across the United States. So there was this huge dust storm where people, they just had to live in the dust day after day after day. It was terrible. Um, it was thick. It would literally bury equipment and fences and parts of homes. And if you read people talking about it, they talk about how you're, you're just always dusty. It's in your mouth, it's in your ears, it's in your hair. If you try to get clean, it doesn't last, you just get dirty again right away because dust was just everywhere. It was just a terrible place. Livestock died. People, some, some people just ended up packing up and moving somewhere else, back east or whatever, because it just, it just wasn't working. And it was, it, was a, so it was a really hard time, really hard time for people living, particularly in the Midwest during that time. That was in the middle of the Great Depression. So it was, it was another thing that made life difficult. Um, so it lasted for 10 years. Well, let, let's write down dust pool. Um, the depression lasted for 10 years and it ended in 1939. How did the depression end? Again, Herbert Hoover tried to do something to make it end. It didn't work. Franklin D. Roosevelt came along and tried to put in programs to make things better and made things a little bit better, but it still did not end the Depression. What finally ended the Depression? Anybody know? World War II, which seems really strange, right? That you have a, a terrible war that ends a Depression. Um, it's kind of strange and sad because World War II was a terrible, terrible war. It's even worse than World War I, and that's going to be our next lesson. We're going to talk about World War II and how awful it was. But the silver lining is that it got the United States out of the Depression. The reason, I think, was because, you know, because of World War II, people had something to do. They had a cause. They had, 
uh, that it's something to motivate them to get out and get to work and, and start doing things and producing things and making things because they were they had to get out and support another war, right? They had to get to the factories to build war equipment and, and it, got the, it got the economic machine moving and working again. Um, and and it, got, it got things, um, yeah, it got, it got things working again. And that actually brought our country out of the Great Depression. Um, so, anyway, um, yeah, just uh, hang in there. Oh, a couple of things I'm going to have for your assignments besides your uh, feedback, which I want you to do, um, your three comments. I also am going to have a video attached. Uh, and this video talks about why the government can't just print money. And, and you guys have asked me this a couple of times. You know, why can't the government just print money to pay back our debt to China? And by the way, even though we do owe a lot of money to China, that's not who we are most in debt to. Who we are most in debt to is, well, I'm going to let you watch the video. It's actually going to probably surprise you, okay? It's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Um, but, but why can't the government just print money and give it to people during a depression if they're starving to death? You know, why can't the government just print money and pay back our debts? Um, anyway, I have a video link that I want you to watch that helps explain that, so hopefully you can understand it. Um, and uh, also a link to some photos that happened during the Dust Bowl. Um, so please check those out, it shouldn't take long. Anyway, again, hang in there. I know we're going through interesting times, but it wasn't half as bad as the Great Depression. And uh, let's be thankful to God for everything that He has given us. Adios.